So far, seven outbreaks of coronavirus have been confirmed globally. As late as December 2019, humans have encountered a new coronavirus that has never been found in humans' body. Our knowledge of this virus is still sketchy. It has been named SARS-CoV-2. Home to eight Nobel Prize laureates, Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory is known as the birthplace of molecular biology. Dr. John Olson is a scientist at CSHL. In December 2019, he was teaching courses in Suzhou, China. Confronted with COVID-19, Dr. John Olson chose to stay. Like initially, I saw lots of things calling it the Wuhan virus. I am really not in favor of that, right? Because this, these viruses can come from anywhere. Coronaviruses are in bat species around the world. My name is John Olson, and I'm the education director here at Cold Spring Harbor Asia DNA Learning Center. One of the things that was very surprising and amazing to me was how fast the virus was identified and sequenced. And if you look at a virus like HIV, it was years before the virus was identified. And here it was about 10 days from the time that people started getting sick till we had the actual DNA sequence of the virus. And then once it's identified and sequenced, um, we can move forward very quickly in our understanding. Chinese scientists quickly released the genetic sequence information of COVID-19, and scientists across the globe began to work at full speed to develop vaccines and drugs to deal with it. But the spread of rumors was much faster than that of drug development. The most appalling rumors even said that COVID-19 came from the laboratory. Anytime there's an outbreak, there's going to be a lot of conspiracy theories and misinformation. It's unfortunate that some U.S. lawmakers actually succumb to this misinformation and spread these rumors. They are not true. So my name is Dr. Amish Adalja. I'm an infectious disease, critical care, and emergency medicine physician. I'm from the Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania area, and I work at the Johns Hopkins Center for Health Security as a senior scholar. This is an animal origin virus that, that's made its way into humans. There's no evidence that this was, this was a manufactured virus. We don't believe that this is a lab accident or a deliberate release from that laboratory. It's important the laboratories are kept safe and we worry about that, but there's no evidence that this is uh, the case and it's not something that's widely accepted or thought about by the scientific community in the United States. Will humans win the battle against COVID-19? Amar Ibadani, a 41-year-old man from Yemen, is a doctor in Chojo Hospital in Zhejiang province of China. As a senior doctor who has been practicing for nearly 20 years, Amar Ibadani has been paid close attention to the outbreak. Actually, this battle is uh, China and Chinese people are winning it for us, for the whole world. I am Amar Al-Badani, I'm from Yemen. This is in the ordinary time. And when it comes to the outbreak of an epidemic, I think doctors feel much more responsibility to do something in this battle. This is our battle. That's why I decided not to take any vacation during this outbreak. Actually, you are safer in China during this outbreak. You're going to your country, and I believe there is no a uh, country such as China can defeat this coronavirus. And yes, all these guys, they have been uh, feeling grateful to me during that advice because they have actually witnessed. And till today, they are really seeing how uh, the numbers of the confirmed cases are decreasing. In, in EU, for example, uh, we have like even uh, more than two weeks with zero confirmed cases, which means that we are fighting uh, the, the COVID-19 in a very successful way. 
I have heard a lot of uh, rumors in the social media, especially in the Facebook and Twitter, talking about the medical staff being forced to go to Wuhan and Hubei to fight against this uh, COVID-19. Uh, that's not true to tell you, my friends. I have seen a lot of uh, competition between the colleagues. The people really want to be first going there. People really volunteered and people really sacrificed. They have done a lot. They have lived their families. In 2003, the SARS virus ravaged China. Since then, China has accelerated the construction of a national disease control and prevention system. Chinese hope that the system will help them respond better, faster, and smarter to another attack. The sudden outbreak of the COVID-19 put this system to the toughest test, as well as China's governance system. Faced with the COVID-19 outbreak, China quickly formed a special group called the National Expert Group on COVID-19. Professor Lan Xue is a member of the group. This uh, expert group is an advisory body for fighting with the virus. And we have about 60 plus people from various fields. So we discuss various uh, policy you know, ideas and then uh, you know, that will be provided to the national leadership to direct the country's fight with the virus. For this particular outbreak, I think there was indeed, uh, there were missed opportunities at early stage. So I think that's something that we really have to examine more and to collect more information to see where exactly things have broken down and how we can fix that. I think that national uh, system that we should make sure that anybody in tampering with that system is a violation of law. And, and I think the second issue that we may also want to think about how to fix the problem is we need to have a robust expert uh, um, system to make the judgment. Because I think early signs always are always incomplete. So may, there's a lot of uncertainties, particularly with a new virus such as uh, COVID-19. In just two months, the COVID-19 outbreak spread from Wuhan to other provinces in China, becoming a major public health emergency with the fastest transmission speed, the widest infection scope, and the greatest difficulty in prevention and control since the establishment of the People's Republic of China. On the contrary, to deal with COVID-19, this is the proof not for the failure, but for the vitality and the validity of the system we have. My name is He Yafei. I am currently pursuing an academic life, being a distinguished professor at Yanjing Academy of Peking University. Certainly, we see some setbacks at the very beginning before we found the right path. But this is not a proof for the failure of China's governance of Chinese system. It is only a proof once again that China's political system, economic system, China's political setup is correct, is the right one, because it has the capacity to correct itself. If there is any shortcomings, any setbacks, it is very capable of correcting these things by itself because it has the wide support of the people and has a very strong, down to the grassroots, a very strong governance system in place. The very different responses to the outbreak among countries with different social systems have aroused concerns and even led to debates about the best and the worst. The bigger the problem, the bigger the challenge, 
the more effective, I think, relatively speaking, the Chinese government is. And therefore, also, that speaks well of the Chinese political system. My name is uh, Martin Jakes. Until recently, I was a senior fellow at Cambridge University. I don't think anyone who knows anything about China should be in the least bit surprised that China can construct two hospitals within uh, 10 days or two weeks, incredibly short space of time. I mean, this is what the Chinese system is so good at doing, which is mobilizing uh, resources and thinking ahead, thinking strategically. China will learn from the weaknesses of what happened, as well as, uh, uh, as, well as the strengths uh, of its subsequent achievement. And yet, in the West now, especially for example in the United States, so slow, so slow. And the testing is so weak, so, so narrow. There's no excuse for this situation because this has been around now for, what, over two months. That's a lot of time the Chinese never had. So I think that what's happened uh, does not prove that the Chinese system is, you know, deeply flawed or something like that. Okay, it does reveal that the, that the mistakes were made. It does reveal that there were some weaknesses. But, you know, the bigger the crisis, the more likely mistakes are to be made. Why? Because you've got to make it up, because you don't have perfect knowledge. And less excusable, in my view, are the mistakes that are now being made uh, in the West, because they, they, they have had the prior experience of China to take into account. In order to contain the spread of COVID-19, from 10 a.m. on January 23, 2020, Wuhan suspended the operation of city buses and subways, closed its airports and train stations. Citizens were asked to stay at home. Since then, other cities in Hubei province have taken similar measures. China has begun an urgent mobilization of national resources. More than 40,000 medical personnel from other provinces in China and the People's Liberation Army have rushed to Wuhan at an incredible speed to support overloaded local hospitals. Dr. Tang Tiantian is one of them. In my opinion, we don't ask for praise because these people are our people. We do all the things to protect our people, our people's interests, to protect our country. My name is Tang Tiantian. I come from Guangzhou, Guangdong province. I am an attending physician from the respiratory department of Sun Yat-sen Memorial Hospital. Our hospital has sent 151 medical staff to Wuhan. I will always remember a patient. He was a 65 years old man. On my shift, I pay a visit to the bedside, and he suffered from from hard breathing. We gave him the the mask to help him to breathe, but the mask was not fitable for him, so he put his put his hands like this means oh, please help me please help me but he could not speak any words he just put his hand like this my colleagues and i tried to um, make him feel better with the mask but it did not help on um, but during the the whole thing he always he will always do this do this um it means yes you you help me you helped me at that time, even though I feel very suffered, but you did help me. So I think I will always remember this old man. Another thing is our patients, they, their, their optimism um, moved me very much because they are the real hero. They face the virus uh, directly as they fight this disease as their body as a battlefield. When I see them get better, I'm quite moved because they are so strong. 
My biggest wish now is to win this battle as soon as possible. So at that time, I can go back to Guangzhou to see my family, to hold them, to tell them we win. Our country wins. I miss them so much. The lockdown of Wuhan city is equivalent to isolating an important urban transportation hub larger than New York City. And its scale is shocking. What happened to the citizens of Wuhan after the lockdown? Dr. Sarah Plateau described the experience as from fear to optimism. I live in Wuhan since eight years and uh, the things that I like most of Wuhan is not a thing, but are the people. I really love Wuhan people. At the very beginning, like the first week of the outbreak, when everything closed down, of course I was concerned because like, how do I do the shopping? How do I buy things? But, you know, for example, my university, uh, they bought for us teacher like a package of food in order to support us. I remember, for example, uh, one occasion and um, very, very nice, uh, you know, so the compound was sealed. And so I asked in, my, in the WeChat group of my building how to buy food. So I noticed that people start to talk in Chinese, say, hey, she's Italian, she needs, you know, some spaghetti and sauce. After 20 minutes, my, my doorbell rang and I was like, who is there? And there were these or two of my neighbors and they brought me some vegetables, some eggs, some food and one of them also brought a nice, uh, a nice note saying, Sarah, be strong, China will fix it. This is a song written by a Belgian musician, Shang Ma Long, for Wuhan. He was originally invited to hold a grand concert in Wuhan, which was postponed because of the outbreak. I think China did, did the best and even maybe gave lessons to us. Kind of, no, it's not a lesson, but we have to follow them. I have heard a, a point of view, especially they said if I had the coronavirus, I would go to China to be, to be cured. So I agree. We have to be united. It, it, it's, 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 it's said in my song uh, by Robert Murray, the old, one of the authors. Uh, you might think you're alone, but uh, the word stands united, strong and brave with you. Facing the virus, the common enemy of humans, somebody chose to complain, hate, and ignore everything, while others chose to fight together. I understand of uh, this disease. I know that uh, it's possible to stop. It's possible to, to win this battle. Because I'm in front line, I see the news. I know that they are fake news, but I do not uh, take care of that. I'm Dr. Glelea Rouli I'm from Benin Republic in West Africa. My responsibility was to take uh, the, to do the screening of the patient, to take the temperature of, of some uh, common patient, to register the case, the new case, or those who are on suspicion of uh, the disease. What made me really deep impression about my colleague was um, most of them didn't see their family for nearly one month. It's really touching. Their doctor, their son, their ma mother, all are in the house. After that, when you see the medical personnel with the protective cloth, after 10 hours, more than 10 hours before getting out, you will see from the start uh, with the facial mark all in the face. It's really touching with the sweat, all these things, it's really touching. Chinese doctors give their life to save China. Virus doesn't know any country, doesn't know any races. 
there's been no color. We have many virus who appear to in Europe, in uh, Africa, and then this time it appear here. We don't have to give a country name to a virus. We have to be united as one to fight this virus. In 2014, it's true that uh, Africa has a huge uh, infectious disease called Ebola. And uh, China was uh, the first country who come to help Africa in that battle. So those are the stuff who give me the motivation to say if China, I know if it happened to my country, Benin, Chinese people, Chinese governments should be the first country who support us. At present, the death toll caused by COVID-19 has exceeded the death toll from SARS and Ebola, and its infectivity is far more than most viruses known to humans. COVID-19 brings not only death to humans, but also complaining, panic, and forcibly restricts human economic activities. There are just so many stories that, that have impressed me about China's development. First of all, it's, it'd, be, it'd be hard for me to criticize China's system that has been so successful over the past 40 years in achieving amazing goals of lifting people out of poverty, creating jobs, giving people opportunities they couldn't, couldn't ever have imagined. Your country has done so much to keep the virus in China and to keep people from China catching the virus at the expense of your economy. And if this virus ever gets into the United States, it's hard to imagine the United States being able to muster the courage to say, okay, we're gonna shut our economy down for like four or five weeks you know, because we don't want people to get sick. From London to New York, from Tokyo to Singapore, from Beijing to Paris, all economic activities have been weakened by the sudden outbreak of COVID-19. This is not only a reminiscence of the Black Death that's sweeping the European continent in the middle of the 14th century, or the plague of the 17th century London. It is feared that, like dominoes, COVID-19 will not only slow down the pace of the global economic recovery, but also destroy globalization. <laughs> Costco shipping is the important carrier to get through the lifeblood of the economic globalization. Costco shipping ranks first in the world in terms of comprehensive capacity. How does such an industry giant, which is closely related to the global economic trends, perform in the globe when the COVID-19 is spreading? The coronavirus outbreak is certainly have some impact for the global economy and the shipping industry. It can show that about 1,300 vessels is sailing around the world now. We worked seven days, 24 hours, even under the severe situation to guarantee these supplies on time delivery. After now, we have transported more than 120,000 train of medical supplies. Since February 10th, we have about 1,035 subsidiaries in China resume work. We believe when outbreak is fed, the demand will rebound rapidly. China's importance in the global supply chain and the industry will not be undermined. The WHO judges that COVID-19 is not only a super epidemic that spreads across the globe, but also a large infectious epidemic that might be controlled for the first time of human history. David Gossett, a French scholar living in Shanghai, agrees with this view. He also gives a long-term forecast of China's development. Of course, we are facing, China has been facing a very, very severe crisis, but this crisis is not going to fundamentally change the course of uh, history. The Chinese Renaissance is uh, here to stay and it is going to change uh, the world. We have not only seen a resilient China because this coronavirus was a shock, the shock is being 
absorbed and by the way I expect a rapid recovery of the Chinese uh, economy and when you declare victory over such a crisis you become stronger. This crisis will not affect the Chinese Renaissance. It might even accelerate the Chinese Renaissance. According to the statistics from the International Monetary Fund, China's contribution to global economic growth has exceeded 30%. Professor Ian Golding is one of the most authoritative scholars on globalization. In his view, this epidemic has made the world realize China's huge influence in the global economy and its engine is still full of power. And very different to SARS in 2003, when China was only 3% of the world economy. Today, it's more like 18% of the world economy. These risks like we saw in the financial crisis, the super spreading or the financial crisis, cyber attacks and viruses, and we see the super spreading of pandemics. This is a necessary underside, underbelly of globalization, what I call in my book, the butterfly defect of globalization. Globalization has been a force for immense progress in the world, including in China. It is the reason why China has grown so quickly over the last 30, 40 years, because it has opened up to the world and become part of the global economic system. What we're seeing now with uh, the coronavirus is a shock uh, to China and to the world. It will slow growth, but this will be a temporary phenomenon. I think we will see recovery, uh, and in fact there might be even some higher level of growth as we catch up with what has not been done during the period where there's been quarantine and disruption to supply chains. So I do not see a disruption to the long-term trend. 